welcome to this second keynote session of the Battle of Ideas Festival, What's Happened to Privacy? My name is Ella Whelan. I'm the co-convener of the Battle of Ideas Festival, journalist, um, author of What Women Want, and really delighted to be chairing this pretty important debate about privacy, where we draw the lines between public and private, what's important about privacy, what's and, and what's perhaps damaging about secrecy. Um, what's the difference between a secret and something that's private? A lot of this has centered around WhatsApp, hence the catchy title, which was my doing. <laughs> um, but it extends beyond that. There has been discussions in Parliament and outside in the wider world about the online safety bill, the ramifications for a um, government becoming involved in people's private conversations, uh, people's public conversations, um, the rights and wrongs of having secret groups, whether that's you know people having secret groups for nefarious reasons, saying nasty things, or indeed for, you might even say, moral or just reasons, political organization and all that kind of thing. God help me if anyone ever gets hold of my WhatsApps, that's all I'll say. I'll have to leave the country and, or do something more drastic because there are lots of things that I say in private that I hope no one ever, ever finds out about. On the other hand, I'm sure I'm not the only person in this audience who at least felt conflicted about the leaking of Matt Hancock's WhatsApps. You know, could, was happy to have some of that information was happy to know, or at least let's put it this way, it was grateful to know some of that information. Um, but, you know, a serious question of whether it should have been leaked, of whether there's a consequence for, you know, uh, the running of this country if politicians feel that they can't talk in private, can't talk off the record. Um, everybody's forgotten about the Warwick WhatsApp. Um, route, but that's a really interesting one as well, which happened, which is a group of, uh, if I'm remembering it right, a group of young men, students, sharing some uh, rather distasteful information on a WhatsApp group, you know, making jokes about um, fellow students, women, um, some of it pretty unpleasant, who, you know, had their WhatsApp leaked and then suffered disciplinary con uh, consequences. Is that right? Should you be allowed to make nasty jokes in private if you decide that you're never going to take action on them in public? So anyway, a real moral quandary here um, and something that I think our, our panelists are really gonna help shed some light on. So I'm gonna introduce them in the order that they speak. They'll give some thoughts and we'll head straight out to you guys for some comments and questions in the order in which they're speaking. Sat next to me here, we have David Davis, who is an MP for the Conservative Party, and he's been very vocal in his criticism of moves to impede encryption in the online safety bill and in opposition to things like facial recognition, infringements upon privacy. All these speakers have huge biographies. You should go to our website to find out more about them. But because we've only got an hour and a quarter, they're going to get short ones. So that's David Davis. Sat next to David is Josie Appleton, who's the director of Civil Liberties Group Manifesto <laughs> Club and author of Officious Rise of the Busybody State. She's, uh, Josie has been writing about privacy and um, state intervention for quite some time. And her letter on liberty on the issue, on the pandemic and infring infringements on freedom and privacy, is on sale on her bookstore, so go get a copy of that. Over on the right here is Tim Stanley. Tim is a columnist and leader writer at the Daily Telegraph, uh, which is, uh, as you well know, a publication at the heart of many discussions about those WhatsApps <laughs> and privacy. And he's the author of Whatever Happened to Tradition, History, Belonging, and the Future of the West, which is also available at our bookshop, so go get yourself a copy of that. And last but not least, sat next to me here is Dr. Tiffany Jenkins. Tiffany is a writer and broadcaster. She's got a really exciting book um, forthcoming out soon called Strangers and Intimates, which will look at the importance of a private life, space for mistakes, bad behavior, secrets, and was, much, was a large part the inspiration for this session, thinking about that, that tension around privacy and secrecy. Her previous book, Keeping Their Marbles, uh, which has also suddenly become extremely relevant in relation to the British Museum's inability to keep a hold of some of their <laughs> treasures. So can we please welcome our speakers? <laughs> now, David, you're going to kick us off. So your thoughts, please. Thank you, Madam Chairman. It's a pleasure to be here, even if I was given an identity card when I walked in the door. Um, I've lost it, so it's fine. And so, um, the, the blurb at the beginning of, of the debate, uh, in, in the advertising of the debate, said, I think, the digital age seems to, be rel to relentlessly blur the boundaries between the private and the public. 
Well, it's worse than that. It's dissolved the boundaries between the private and the public. And before I talk very briefly about the state involved in that, let's just look at the commercial side of it. Privacy has never been more eroded in our history. There's never been more data on every individual in the Western world than there is today. I mean, consider Google, Instagram, LinkedIn, Netflix, Amazon, Twitter, Facebook, Microsoft, PayPal, just to pick the big ones, all gather data on you and all trade in that data, all of them. Uh, now, it wouldn't matter if all that data was held in encrypted silos and nobody saw it and it was carefully protected, but it is. It's literally traded to the tune of about 150 billion pounds a year. That's the size of the market, probably bigger now. Um, so we are, as citizens, we're electronically naked, all of us, basically. Now, who cares? Does this matter? Um, you know, a lot of people will think, well, this is how come I get, you know, free search engines and free internet and so on. And so it saves me paying for things. And anyway, do I mind if people target adverts on me or send me things that I think I might like to buy? Well, maybe not. But actually, it's much more important than that. Because that vast amount of data, and it's getting more important by the second, that vast amount of data in conjunction with very powerful algorithms, you hear people talking about AI, but very powerful analytic algorithms, build stereotypes of you all, and in all sorts of places. So if you are being judged for your credit worthiness, maybe for a credit card, you'll be there, or uh, a mortgage. Uh, or for insurance, particularly health insurance, uh, or your job prospects. I mean, there have been scandals in the States about people being shut out from adverts just on the, the, what the, an, the analysis of them uh, was, uh, that, that was arrived at after looking at their, their online data. Health services, all of these are proven examples of the use of that data to affect important aspects of people's lives, not their free adverts, but important aspects of their, of their uh, people's lives. Now, most people are unaware of it. Most people don't bother about it. It's not particularly, I mean, when we had the online uh, safety bill going through and we're talking about encryption, there wasn't a huge public engagement in that, not at this point. but. When, we, when I was trying to fight off identity cards, when we were successfully fighting off identity cards under the Blair government, for most of the time, 80% of the public wanted an identity card. They thought it was a good idea. Yeah? And, I, my, and my arguments were futile. They're just beating against a, a brick wall. And then the state lost two CDs with everybody's tax records on them. And within one week, it was 70% against identity cards. Now, I wish it was my persuasive powers. It wasn't. It was a single fact. A single demonstration of the dangers of these things. And that's going to happen at some point with privacy. Um, but it's, 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 it will take time and it might be too late. Now, if you think GDPR protects you, think again. All right? How many of you, hands up, how many of you read all those contracts be before you click accept online? Huh? How many? Yeah. Oh, one, I've got one, I've got a lawyer in the front row, yeah? but, but almost nobody reads them. And in any event, they're now written to, to, uh, in a convoluted way to get past it. And if you think VPN protects you, virtual private networks protect you, well, you should know that the providers of virtual private networks are one of the biggest traders in your information and in selling your information. So, so that's before we get to state surveillance. Now, I've been in government one way or another over about a decade or so. I mean, I've been in Parliament for about 30 odd years, but I've been in government as a minister for about a decade in that time. And one of the things that you see happen every time that Whitehall can't solve a problem is let's try identity management. You know, a voter ID card. They think they think there's a problem there. We'll have a voter ID card. Vaccines, let's have a vaccine ID card. Um, and then, of course, we go on to other things. You've got facial recognition cameras that the chairman mentioned. Um, you've got the mass collection of data, uh, sometimes for our allies. Uh, it's now 10 years since Edward Snowden uh, highlighted what, uh, what the various governments do. One of the things he highlighted was that our government intercepted every single backup of Google data, all Google data, from their hub in London to their hub in Dublin, all of it, and gave it to the NSA. That's how governments behave with your data. Um, the online safety bill tried to do away with the encryption. We, we stopped that, so uh, fortunately. The so-called counter-disinformation units monitor all. Monitor us all. I've been monitored. I think Tim's been monitored for articles he wrote about, uh, uh, about the, uh, the, the, the nature of, of the COVID management and so on.
And as we speak, as we sit here, probably this week, the National Health Service is considering um, handing over the management of your health data, the most sensitive data you have at all, to a company called Palantir, uh, who grew up, whose genesis was working for the National Security Agency in America. So that's where we are. We are facing a huge pressure and the rate is accelerating as AI comes in as well and as more data gets into the public domain. Uh, it, the rate is accelerating and the only way we'll stop it is if we persuade the public that it's a bad idea and that there are big, big risks in this. Uh, and then, because the public care about it, my colleagues in Parliament care about it, and then they make governments care about it. That's the way to do it. Thank you. Josie, your thoughts, please. Thanks. Um, I mean, I think far from privacy being a protected sphere, I think in many ways the home is very much a specially targeted sphere. Um, so, for example, civil injunctions can be issued in the street on a much higher standard than they are in the home. If you want to issue in the home, it's much easier than it is on the street. So something that's legal in the street is illegal in the home. So I think that, that kind of the, the, the line defending the home and defending the idea of being watched is completely gone. But there's much more a kind of special targeting of that sphere. So we work a lot on community protection notices and we've come across people who've had orders, an old lady saying she couldn't wear a bikini in her garden, a man saying he couldn't stall the wheelbarrow behind his shed. People have been, had orders saying they can't cry in their own home, they can't, the volume they have their TV at. Basically there's this targeting of the home and what people can do in a minute prescription of the way they conduct themselves in their home. And I think this kind of targeting of privacy is really a view of what human nature is. So there's this sort of idea that the closed door is a bad thing. Um, whenever the door is closed, whenever people are kind of on their own together, what do they do? How do they behave when the door's closed? And the idea is that really, you know, they're abusing each other, they're harassing, they're causing problems. And the, the, kind, of, the, the kind of night in this scenario is the watcher, the third party, so that the camera or the person who's, who's watching the adult who's with a child, there's always the third party is the kind of the savior and the, the people on their own who, um, who are suspicious. And I think this is a massive turnaround for modern capitalist society because the sphere of the private sphere, which developed in the 18th century was very much a romanticized sphere. You know, it was sort of idealized. You had a kind of family um, sitting around the fire, playing the piano and reading books and things like that. It was very much a sphere of love, of freedom, of cultivation. And it was a sphere that kind of enabled you to defend yourself a bit against the public world of the market and the hustle and bustle and develop yourself, have human relations. So not have interested relations, but human relations. So I think that this kind of inversion of the, this is almost like the sacred principle of modern society really um, is, is very dangerous in many ways because the private sphere was a sphere where people could be grounded in their personalities, you know, kind of, you kind of, in that, in that space of freedom and love. And that's actually the kind of place where you're really yourself. And now with the, the attack on that, then you really lose that. And I very much see that with people who receive community protection notices. Like they're often, they can't sleep, they have anxiety problems. It's a very kind of distressing effect. And it has much more effect to have a council officer telling you what to do or neighbor um, filming you than, for example, to be arrested on a political demonstration or have some kind of public reprimand. So I think that that kind of intervention of people, what they do in their own home, it has a really destructive effect on the personality and on the functioning of society. Just say something briefly about WhatsApp messages and that sort of thing. I mean, for me, there, there is no right to privacy for public decision making. You know, the right to privacy is something that you have as a private citizen in your home. And politicians have that in their own home as a, as a, as a, as a private citizen. But in the sphere of public decision-making, that should be a public sphere. There should be minutes and meetings. And it should be accountable. Who said what? Why were decisions taken? And that should be as visible as possible. You know, in ancient Athens, the way that officials conducted themselves was very much overseen all the time by committees. Um, how did you conduct yourself? You had to conduct, account for yourself at the end of your term of office. I think that's very important that, that there is that accountability. They should not be making the decisions on WhatsApp. That's a personal, interpersonal forum. The EU chief should not have been negotiating a Pfizer contract over text message. And we will never see those text messages. You know, I think that there is a new privacy for policy at the same time that there's a publicization of private life. 
I think there are new spheres in which people make policy, which you will never see. You know, we would never have seen the Twitter files had it not been for Musk buying Twitter. We would never have seen that. So I think there is a kind of, there is a new way in which um, the world of policymaking becomes more secret. And at the same time that our private lives are picked over and revealed. So I think it is, all Twitter files are fantastic. WhatsApp files are fantastic. We, we, we need to know why decisions were make made, but they should be made in publicly accountable forums with minutes in a proper manner and publicly visible and accountable. So, so we've started off really excellently with, you know, position that there's obviously an issue for privacy online digitally but as Josie has pointed out it doesn't just happen in your text or on your phone or on Twitter and the internet this is also very much a sort of analog thing um off offline in the real world IRL as the kids say where a privacy is being challenged and eroded for uh, for a time quite before the internet okay so now we're going to have Tim your thoughts Thank you. And I, I'm amused to discover that I might have been monitored for things I wrote about lockdown. Uh, that's so typical. You spend years spying for China and they come after you on masks. <laughs> uh, in the past, when we discussed the erosion of privacy, we thought of the threat as largely coming from the state, that it would be secret police tapping our phones or social workers breaking down the door. The ultimate symbol of government power was the two-way telescreen in George Orwell's 1984. In Soviet Union, television watches you. But of course, the video phone is now considered not just quotidian, but convenient. The phone listens to us and gathers our data, not to keep the state informed, but to see if we need a light turned on or, as I increasingly find, an advert for something to do with my hips. Big Brother is real and back on television. Contestants volunteer to be watched 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And what the Stasi once called security, we have rebranded as entertainment. Hence, I really don't think we can have a discussion about the death of privacy without owning up to how happy we've been to surrender it. Britain has changed. One fun thing to do is to compare footage of British people being interviewed for television in the 1970s. They come across as tongue-tied, nervous, and observe the camera warily as if it <coughs> might bite them. By contrast, Vox poppers today appear camera ready and are a font of opinions and can <coughs> film themselves being filmed and put that film up online on their personal channel. For we are now not just the star of our own lives, but excitingly, we have become writer, director and publicity agent too. A few of us have graduated to making porn. This is the age of sexting, of Tinder, of Love is Blind, the television show where people propose marriage to someone sight unseen, and of Naked Attraction, the TV show where people pick a date having seen everything in graphic detail from the toes up. A surprising fan of Naked Attraction, by the way, is my 75-year-old mother. <laughs> I asked her why she insists on watching this stomach-churning parade of bottoms and boobs, and she said... Do you know, before Naked Attraction, I had never seen another naked body other than your father's. That is how radically our society has changed within one generation. My parents thought that sex was so private a matter that they slept in separate bedrooms. The success rate of these dating shows, by the way, is very low. The engagements don't last. The dates are surprisingly sexless. People generally go home disappointed. And Love Island, a particularly ghastly show, is now linked to no less than four suicides, which suggests that the new culture of sharing has not broken down some repressive Victorian straitjacket, but has accentuated people's natural anxieties about themselves. Worse, it has invited us to become viewers, to be nasty about people's lives, both for laughs and for clicks. Could it be that old-fashioned privacy was the original safe space? Safest of all because it wasn't carved out for an identity group, but for the individual. Privacy did not end with a statute. Rather, technology altered behavior, businesses cashed in, and government legislation, be it to protect the use of our data or to gain access to it, has followed behind, in democratic states, rather slowly. Dictators, of course, are always nimbler. Social media played a famous role in mobilizing protests during the Arab Spring, but the authority is also sought to turn that technology against dissenters by using it to monitor opinion and to identify troublemakers. So technology changes us, but we can also reshape technology to serve timeless desires. Have you noticed how often people use social media to lie? 
They airbrush their appearance and choreograph their insights into their inner world. If you've ever tried da online dating, you would think that everybody in Britain is 29, precisely, has the body of an Olympian and spends their entire life touring Europe. I would say that unless we can be truly alone, we cannot be ourselves. If we are constantly watched, we will perform to reflect other people's expectations. And worse, we won't feel free to think, write, or speak for ourselves without the threat of social sanction. A world without the locked diary is a world of stunted imagination, conformity, and deceit. Performative exhibition also erodes that quaint virtue of modesty, which taught that others don't need to know what you're thinking or doing because, honey, you ain't that important. We used to say that British society was self-governing, that we didn't need invasive policing because we could rely upon a national quality of quietness, of modesty, of mutual respect of each other's space. You didn't have to call the fuzz to complain about a next door neighbor making so much noise because they would never think to impose themselves upon your privacy by doing so. I am a fan of privacy to the extent that I've even been known to put a shopping bag over a till rather than have the bastard thing film me. But in feeling this way, in feeling this way, I find myself antiquated, a bit silly, and alone, a stranger in a brave new world of online consumers. About 20 years ago, as David mentioned, we debated ID cards in Britain, and critics said airily that the idea was un-British. But now, in an era when the phone has become almost another organ, when one is constantly required to type in passwords or blink at a camera or update our status, would most voters really find any objection to carrying an ID card? If privacy is no longer a definitional British characteristic, the case for it becomes one of upholding civil rights. That is to stand up for the shy minority, those of us who wish to opt out of surveillance. Such a very alternative lifestyle would confuse and horrify politicians and corporations, and probably most voters. Yet those of us who love privacy, and by we, I include religious minorities, sexual fetishists, political radicals, eccentrics, and introverts, all we are actually asking for is to be ignored. Tiff, your thoughts. In the early hours of June 21st, 2019, neighbours of Carrie Simons and Boris Johnson, who is then campaigning to be leader of the Conservative Party, overheard a heated argument between the couple, which they happened to record. They also called the police, and after knocking on the door, uh, the police came up, the police came around within minutes. They found the couple were in the middle of a heated argument and left them to it. Everybody was safe and well. Nonetheless, however, that recording somehow found itself onto the pages of The Guardian, the front page, in fact. Under the headline, Boris Johnson, police called to loud altercation at the potential PM's home, the uh, headline of this quality newspaper reported that a woman could be heard complaining that a white sofa had been damaged with red wine. <laughs> you just don't care for anything do you? You're a spoiled man. You have no care for money or anything, she said. Get out of my flat. Johnson was heard refusing to leave and telling Simons to get off my effing laptop. Now, I think we laugh slightly because A, Boris Johnson has a certain figure, a uh, gesture figure, but also because we've all been there. We've all had that argument, right? We know we behave badly or slightly embarrassingly behind closed doors. Um, that's obviously what the neighbours were doing and what the Guardian was doing. They were seeking to discredit the future PM. But I think it's profoundly shocking that they put it on the front page of their newspaper and justified it. I think it shows that there is a kind of a historic shift where the previously assumed recognition that one of the two, the public and private were two spheres that were separate and you do things differently in each one. I think that's gone, or, I mean, these things are always really quite apocalyptic. I think that is um, dissolving, but I think the internet and the digital world had very little to do with it. I think it accelerated it, but it did not fundamentally change it. And I think if anything, sometimes focusing on digital helps us to obscure the real problem. So what I want to try and do briefly is look at two influences that I think are far more important that developed in the 20th century. There's a book by David Reisman, who uh, was an American sociologist written in the 1950s called The Lonely Crowd. 
And what he does is look at the shift in American society from production to consumption, a shift in authority from traditional authority to new sources of authority, in his view, were radio and television. And he talked about how the rising middle class, the American character, was moving from an inner gyroscope to an outer one. They were becoming less concerned with kind of traditional ways of doing things and behaving and much more outward. Um, you had then also Richard Sennett's book, the, the Fall of Public Man, in which he looked at the kind of incorporation of intimacy into public life. You had great discussions about authenticity. You had Candid Camera. You had the first reality television programs. Uh, the Family in 1974 with Paul Watson was a fly in the wall series about a family um, with a matriarch called Margaret Wilkins. And in the first episode, Paul Watson, the documentary maker, asked her what she wanted to get out of the series because it was going to be a huge invasion into her privacy. And she said, yes, we've talked it over. And what we want to do is show what real life is like. Real life isn't like the TV sitcoms. It isn't clean kitchens. You know, it is the grit and the dirtiness and the authenticity. You already had then this sort of much more outward sense in which being authentic and being real was being open and showing to a certain degree your emotions and your feelings and your family life. That happened around the same time as the pathologization and the opening up of the private sphere. So as people were becoming much more open and more intimate and public, there were kind of invitations in. Uh, Edmund Leach, the provost of Cambridge University, gave a wreath lecture in 1964 in which he talked about the family with its narrow disconsents and narrow privacy being responsible for all sorts of social ills. So you have this turn away from kind of structures of society as explanations for social problems. In this case, it was student protest towards the family. The family is to blame. You have an argument within feminism between liberal feminists and radical feminists about the way in which the patriarchy is responsible for women's inequality. And where does that start? That starts in the home. So you have this massive opening up. This is a problem for four reasons. I've got one minute. So privacy or rather private life has four essential contributions to make. One is to the self. If we don't have a backstage to have those arguments about red wine and sofas, uh, we don't have a space of, of release. We don't have a space, a space to sort of develop our own thinking and our own conscience. We need it for autonomy and freedom. We need it for intimacy. And some of the kind of most egregious invasions of privacy, I think, are things like consent classes or <coughs> ITV recently announced that it wanted its um, people to announce to their boss when they're having a relationship. That's an invasion of privacy. Yeah. In intimacy, in your most int when, when you do not know quite if you like somebody, you have to announce it to somebody else. That, I think that's a real invasion of privacy. But fourthly, and most interestingly, I think it's essential for public life. I think to have a decent public realm, we need to have a space <coughs> off stage. Uh, we need to be able to have conversations before we open them to the scrutiny of others. And if you look historically, the development of the private realm that Rosie was talking about in the 18th century sort of helped along the development of the public realm. The two are essential. They're aligned upon each other, but they have to be kept separate. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Very very so, I've made a lot of notes. It's very interesting. A lot to get into here, and we've only got half an hour to do it. I mean, you know, questions around whether or not this is, it seems to be, a gen there's definitely been a generational shift, but whether or not this plays along clear generational lines. I mean, for example, there's an interesting thing happening at the moment among sort of Gen Z, but very young people, where they are blaming their boomer and now millennial parents for sharing images of them online. So a young, a young generation that seems to be so kind of bare it all, as Tim described, is actually now saying, You're, how dare you have shared pictures of me as a baby? That's an infringement upon my uh, privacy. And as someone who live streamed my 24 hour child at the Battle of Ideas Festival up there last year. You can kind of imagine what I think about that. Um, but there is, you know, this doesn't seem to be clear cut generationally at the same time as this having obviously changed very drastically from, as was said, the 1970s and onwards. So my microphones are being wielded by brilliant volunteers. 
Thanks. In most board meetings, there's an unwritten rule that there's no stupid question. But if you start having to publish um, detailed minutes, suddenly there does become a stupid question that people self-censor. Can we, do we know how we navigate that? Brilliant. Fantastic. Which, Josie, by the way, I think also does protect, I mean, politicians should be able to, to, you know, fire ideas amongst each other, surely, shouldn't they? Perhaps in private. Okay, at the back. I think that is a question about ID cards as are used for public purposes and there is a certain amount of information on that. I've used them over 20 years now. However, uh, why, we, why we see ID cards as a bad thing when in comparison, everything, our personal life, most sacred things are in Facebook and anywhere else? Well, maybe we should decouple what kind of information we use publicly, what it's used, and what I said is um, maybe politics or some elements should be always public and never could be private, when mm -hmm. something else always should get private. Yeah, my name is Jared Hosier. Does this all start at schools where Google grooms our children with safe sort of graphics making it look like uh, uh, you know being as safe as a teacher and then now we move on to the NHS and the medical field where Palantir wants oh is hoping to get access to our data an NSA contractor I have started now policing what I say to my doctor on the basis it's going to be given away so something's wrong there and it could even affect my health but our medical data, for example, tells us a lot about ourselves. For example, now you sometimes have to give DNA to, um, for, for medical uh, things, and that DNA can be used to reconstruct a medical, a psychological profile of troublesome citizens. Mm -hmm. um, so is there a danger that that, because everything is extended, is there a danger that that will be well, we will soon be policed through our medical records. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I find myself worried that I'm um, uh, agreeing with too many people, uh, but also that means that too many people are agreeing with each other. Uh, so could, could we have a devil's advocate who could tell us why um, it's, it's good to get rid of some privacy, why privacy isn't so, so hot a thing after all? Because, I mean, there have been people who have made that argument, and before I dismiss it, I'd like to, to hear you uh, devil's advocate, uh, um, why the decline of privacy is a good thing? Mm -hmm. Well, also, I mean, let me do it quickly, which is that in a situation in which we seem to have lost a lot of trust in each other, as the panelists sort of described, maybe the situation necessitates that there is, you could argue necessitates, there is, there is more, I suppose someone would put it in terms of more transparency, more openness. I mean, obviously around debates about Brexit and the European Union, I spent all my time saying how terrible it was that there were all these closed doors in um, in Brussels and that we should burst open everything and that everything should be open. And that was because I was reacting to a certain level of what I thought was bad secrecy or, or you know, something anti-democratic there. Does that then have ramifications elsewhere? So there's, you know, a, a transparency, openness. These things are good things, aren't they? Go ahead. Uh, well, I've been working as an archivist in the uh, public sector now for uh, over 30 years. Um, and I'm old enough to remember when they introduced the uh, Data Protection Act in 1998. And when I went on a, on a course, we were encouraged to keep monitoring forms separate from our personnel forms. And the idea being that you'd have your monitoring forms, but they weren't to be tied to your personnel form, so you couldn't be identified as such. Fast forward 25 years later, and um, I, I continue to work in the, in the public sector and our HR departments are, active, are asking us to not only tell us about um, our, our marriage status, our age, etc., but our sexuality, what kind of gender, and there's a whole bunch of genders that I don't even understand anymore um, that they're asking to us to identify. Um, so my, my, my comment, if you'd like, um, how far would you say that identity politics uh, has gone to merging um, 
the private and the public. Great, thanks. Panis, I'm going to take two more. Obviously, there's so much here. You can't answer anything. But when we come back to you, we'll just have a few thoughts. Yes, it's a shame you couldn't do this on Zoom. Then I could judge you by what you have on your bookshelves, <laughs> if you remember that. But you see, I because I'm a teacher and during the COVID period, um, I got annoyed by the fact that I had to teach lessons from my house, which I didn't like because I was told to do it. And, uh, you know, something something could have been breached in my privacy, which I wouldn't have been happy with. And I think it's a difference between you put yourself out there um, and you get judged, you make a mistake, you learn from it. But when you're put out there by somebody else, when you weren't ready, that feels more of an injustice and it's harder to take. So there, there seems to be some sort of sense of control that, that matters here. I also empathise with the, the home thing. I resented it bitterly and art directed a bookcase, which was the only thing I allowed to be seen in public. But I think control is the key. I and mean, if you think about the difference between privacy and secrecy, I think privacy is not about keeping everything secret. It's about controlling who, what you share with whom and when. And, and I think there's two kind of partly separate but also connected questions here. One of them is that control is taken away from us by things like surveillance and, uh, and especially intrusion into the home and by the technological surveillance data gathering profiling which goes on mostly without most of us being aware of exactly how it works if not that it happens itself but then the other side of it is that the nature of our social lives and personal lives has changed and those boundaries have changed and gone into flux that we ourselves relate to each other socially in a much more public performative way as as tiffany was was kind of leaning towards and that it, I mean, and identity, whoever said that, I think is, is very much part of this, that we understand who we are in relation to how we are seen by others, how we project ourselves to others. And that does happen quite a lot through technology and social media. But it's but it predates social media. It's a it's a social change. So it's a huge topic. So I look forward to hearing the panel explain it all to me. <laughs> Lovely. Thanks. Let's give it a go. Um, let's go along the table this way. So Josie, just just a minute or two of your thoughts. Okay, yeah, on the devil's advocate point, I mean, I think the, the classical critique of privacy was that it was an exclusive, narrow, um, individualistic realm and, you know, that the public world in terms of seeing common cause with people was much better. And I think there is an element of that and still remains an element of that in terms of people who are completely obsessed with their children, but, um, you know, would nearly run over another child if they saw them in the street. And I think that there, there is a kind of exclusivity to, 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 to privacy in the private realm if you don't use that in the way that Tiffany's talking about in terms of a jumping off point for the public realm, because the original private realm was not actually private. I mean, the, the salon was the, 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 the public space. So you had people coming around and you would discuss and critique in the salon, which is part of the home. So the family had their sitting room, but they also had the salon, which was oriented towards the public world. And I think that that's very important that you have privacy that's oriented towards the public world and exists in relation to it. And once you get cut off from it, if you are just nomads, then that's a very limited existence. Um, so that, I guess, would be the kind of critique of it and, and why it's a problem. I think, you know, that true solitude and aloneness is always completely barren. You know, the kind of monk going off into the desert and trying to have great revelations, like they don't find out anything, you know, they just spend the time in the cave. You know, the point is that true solitude is not the point of privacy. It's always about that sphere of independence from the world in order to relate critically to the world, in order to have control of your relationships to the world. Um, and, you know, I think that it's, when it does become a nomadism or a, um, um, a solitude, then it is, very, it is very limited and kind of barren. Okay. Right, let me try and do this as quickly as I can. When to get rid of, when to get rid of privacy? I mean, there are quite explicit, clear um, lines and there's some growing ones. Um, public decisions uh, ought to be transparent. Um, uh, the only the only uh, thing I think about Mr. Hancock's WhatsApp uh, use is he's as daft as a brush to believe <laughs> to believe that WhatsApp is private. Really, I mean, um, uh, uh, but but in terms of more generally public decisions, uh, so much of it needs to be in the public in, in the public domain. And we and we actually had um, what Tony Blair thought was his worst ever decision when he brought freedom of information into being. 
I actually think it's his best ever decision, uh, in truth. Uh, so the, there are reasons for that. The, uh, and when the criminal law is involved, of course, privacy collapses. I mean, it, it really has to. The problem we have now, and again, Hancock's an example, is when it's not the criminal law, but the, the rules the government's imposed that then you yourself break. So it, it's, uh, but there are, there, there, there are limits. Now, I, I had some sympathy with the person who said that, however, over-transparency leads to self-censorship. And when whoever it was was talking about their books in their, in their, on their Zoom calls, I suddenly realized that I'd gone in for self-censorship without even realizing it. Because if you see me on Zoom, there's always a bookshelf of nothing but Lord Sansards behind me. And that's just so you can't tell what I'm reading that week, you know. Um, so, uh, so, so, so that's important. Now, control. I mean, this is all about control, particularly in an era which is essentially sanctimonious, prurient, and hypocritically censorious, which is what our era now is. You know, anything you say about yourself is going to be put through a really, really difficult, uh, difficult uh, uh, sensor. So I think, you know, control is the driver of, of, of privacy. That's, that's what's uh, most important. We have to control our own lives. Privacy in many ways is about power. It's about who's in charge. It's about who decides what I do and say, what I can do and say. And when the state impinges on it, that is a deliberate movement of power from the individual to the state. Uh, so, so, uh, and lastly, on, on medical data, I, I've forgotten who raised medical data. Yeah. Um, look, medical data is incredibly intrusive it's incredibly predictive it's incapable of being anonymized if you see somebody saying they're anonymizing your medical data it's rubbish if you want to find my my uh, national health service um thing just look for somebody who's broken their nose five times and was born on december 23rd 1948 you've got me there's only one of me you know um and everybody is the same uh, uh, tony blair you could find by two operations and so on if you know a little bit about somebody the the data can't be anonymized now Thank you. Yeah, the, 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 on, the point of mis, on the point of misuse. Medical data has been misused. If you cast your mind back to the Paddington rail crash, there was one of the victims of it who was critical of the then Blair government. She was a lady with sort of plastic covers on her cheeks, yeah? uh, and they used the medical data against her. They used medical data against somebody else who complained, a, a pensioner who complained. So governments, when they're under pressure, misuse data. And I, I, I picked two Blair examples. I'm sure there are conservative ones too. Uh, they misuse data, and that's what you have to be wary of giving excess power to any government, particularly when it's about you personally. And medical data is the best example I can think of. Okay, thanks, Tiff. Um, okay, a few points. I've just moved from Scotland to England and I'm having dreadful difficulty getting my own medical data because of privacy <laughs> regulations. I think sometimes these things um, are... Uh, the, the, the attempts to try and give people control and privacy over data has been very unhelpful, and I do think at times it is a red herring. I think the Freedom of Information Act, quite rightly, as Tony Blair said, was a massive mistake. It wasn't the only thing, but there was, it was an attempt to really to, to garner authority through transparency. And I don't think that is actually a way of necessarily being accountability. You have to be able to talk about your decisions and why you've taken them, but show every element of them, I don't think you necessarily have to do. I think it's also led to a culture of journalism, which is all about FOI requests. Josie does brilliant things with FOI requests, but um, there is uh, there are other ways of doing investigations. And I think the recent leaking scandal, and the key here is leaking, it's not encryption or anything else, it's people leaking on each other um, and also making mistakes that are so obviously um, the wrong thing to do. Matt Hancock giving his WhatsApp messages to Isabel Oakshot, a journalist at a newspaper with a known record for exposing such things with a lock anti-lockdown agenda. I mean, it was his own mistake because he doesn't know what is and what is not, uh, what should and shouldn't be public and what and should and shouldn't be private um just a, an additional point on leaking is that you've seen this sort of leaking from uh is it jack dexterra the pentagon papers in america leaking for no purpose just for its own sake not even to the media but onto a social media channel called discourse and it's such as this as it's almost like this kind of uh, authority given just to exposing any sort of data 
anything, any information. And it makes it very, does actually make things very unsafe. And it does mean that it's difficult for politicians to work. Um, one tiny little more point before uh, Ella bats me. I mean, Josie um, talked a little bit about the inadequacies of private life. And that's true. Um, you need private life and you need public life. And I think at the moment we have neither. And I think COVID was like the the prime kind of intense reality of that. So there was no public life. There was no, that you couldn't literally go out into public. You couldn't go to libraries. You couldn't go, Parliament shut. Uh, there was no public debate. Um, and also, did you have private life? Or do, yes, in that you were in the home, but you couldn't leave it. Uh, you couldn't invite your friends around. There was no freedom within it. And you were often exposed, um, exposed to employers, uh, exposed to teachers and all the rest of it. Um, so that was a denuded public and private life. And that's uh, what we don't want. Tim. Yes, thank you. Uh, on the point about uh, what role has identity politics played, I, I think it, it just is axiomatic that if the personal becomes political, mm -hmm. there will be a, a, an encouragement of pressure to share and to tie public policy to the personal. So I, I, I think identity politics is probably very important in that. Um, uh, uh, yeah. On the case against privacy, I mean, uh, having made an argument for it, of course, one might say, but you're a journalist and no one has less respect for it than journalists. So how can you possibly have that position? Well, of course, the argument against privacy, from a, if we're talking about power dynamics, is the case for transparency. Uh, that if the rich and the powerful are able to do things without people knowing uh, how they've done them, their motivations or, or, or anything like that, uh, then they can govern our lives as a kind of a shadowy operation. And one, and certainly from a journalistic point of view, I don't, I don't wish to see that happen at all. Also from the point of view of a historian, I'm wary about that too. Uh, I, uh, before I was a journalist, I was a, essentially a presidential historian. And it occurred to me when I was last writing books about presidents in the 2000s that there was going to be a huge change take place. Because if you went to a presidential library for, I wrote a lot about Richard Nixon, you, there were just stacks and stacks, millions of pages of memos and all things written down. Every aspect of presidential life was written down. And then suddenly in the 2000s, because of email, all of this just vanished. And I did think at the time, it, does this mean we're not going to be able to write the history of the Obama era or the Trump era because it's not been written down and it's all through private uh, communications. The interesting thing is that actually those private communications then became public and we found a new way of noting, uh, of, of, uh, of bringing them together, archiving them and making them publicly accessible. And of course, one of the big scandals was essentially a, a, a privacy uh, data scandal. Hillary Clinton in 2016, it's one of the reasons why she lost the election, was over the question of uh, is, is material used in an administration her material? What can she do with it? Can we see it? Should we be allowed to see it? Et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's really interesting how the electronic age has actually ca caught up with the presidential. But one thing I learned in the course of studying presidents is very often they want you to know what they were thinking. They want to edit it and to censor it, of course, but they also, because they are narcissists, have an obsession with the world knowing what, every sing what was behind every single decision. Why did Richard Nixon install the Watergate tapes? Because he wanted a historical record of what was discussed. He wanted to control it. The plan was never to release the whole thing, my goodness. No, but nonetheless, he thought it was important that a record was kept. Having said all of that, so I'm all for transparency, uh, partly because I work at an editorial level, I also have some sympathy towards policymakers and the pressures they come under and the importance that private discussions can play in that. And I'll give one example. Uh, I remember that at the very beginning of the COVID crisis in an editorial meeting, this is just when it kicked off in China, and we were having an editorial discussion about it. And I put the point, what if this is nothing? What if this is just blown out of all proportion, we're completely wrong, and we're responding in totally the wrong way? Now, having saying that in an editorial meeting doesn't matter so much. Would I want it to be made public that I had said that at that time? No, I would have been publicly ridiculed by a population that was terrified and was moving in one particular direction. At a cabinet level, do people have the freedom to say that? Well, if there is excessive transparency, if there is no privacy, then it means no one around the table is putting the minority opinion, is saying, should we go to war right now? I know everyone's very upset, but is it the wise thing to do? Should we have a lockdown right now? I know people are frightened, but is it the wise thing to do? If you have complete transparency, uh, then you're actually going to deprive yourself of, a, of the airing of a minority opinion, of asking the stupid question that actually in time might be validated.
Brilliant, brilliant. Okay, let's head back out. Somebody on the panel, I'm not sure who, maybe it was Tiffany, um, remarked that privacy arose at a certain point in history, I think, late 18th century. Um, so it's historically delimited. You know, the, the vast majority of human history has done very well without it. It, it became important at a certain moment. It's also very important in a certain cultural area of the world. You know, privacy seems to mean something very different uh, in, in India or, you know, outside the West. You know, I think street urchins in Bombay do not suffer from too much privacy. So I'm, I'm just wondering if you could remark a little on, on what, what that historical delimitation and cultural delimitation tells us about the nature of privacy and whether those conditions are now passing, the, the conditions that brought this, this thing into being 200 or more years ago and, and are perhaps now disappearing. Lovely, over here. Yeah, um, it's nice to see a politician who I actually recognize and one of the few in the last at least 20 years who actually has some principles, so I'm delighted that uh, David Davis is here. Um, I just want to ask what you think about the public and how the public think about privacy, because while we can say we live in a sort of selfie society, I think all of us, and if you ask anyone out in the world if they want privacy, they would say yes, it's just natural. But at the same time, do they defend the privacy of other people? And I, I find myself in a, a situation where I, I describe it as a kind of moral inversion. So it's like if you watch football, you occasionally get this situation where a footballer walks up to another player and put, just gently puts his head against the other guy's head. And the other guy dives on the floor and starts writhing around. But the guy that put his head like that gets the red card and the guy writhing on the ground gets nothing. And most of us, I think, look at this and think, this is moral inversion. This is the wrong way around. And when I look at WhatsApp private messages that friends have been chatting and saying all sorts of crap to each other, and then one of them gives it to the press, I'm looking at the guy that gives it to the press and thinking, you're a scumbag, but the people who get done and sometimes imprisoned are the people that are saying things on WhatsApp. And if you read the press, nobody ever questions this. But I wonder what the public think. Because at the minute, as far as I can see, there's no defense of privacy in that situation. But I don't know if the public think that's moral inversion because the real scumbag is the guy that gave the WhatsApp message to the press. What do you think? Brilliant. Thanks. Obviously, it's a. I'm, not, I'm reminded of the case of the is it Met police officers mm. sharing images of dead girls and saying things about them. In that instance, who is the scumbag? Maybe they're all scumbags. Um, but there's, you know, in a situation where um, moral standards have sunk so low, what prioritization does privacy take? And, you know, there, no one, I don't think, yet has used the word whistleblower. Um, is, you know, how does that play into it in terms of what is the difference between a whistleblower, a leaker, and a, and a scumbag rat? You know, where does... Or Public what, interest. What are, yeah, okay, maybe it is right here. Um, but I just wanted to ask a question about privacy in public, if that makes sense. So I'm a school teacher too. And we've already, we, we're a primary school, so we have quite strong filtering systems in our school to stop children accessing certain sites when they go on the internet. Due to the changes recently in child protection, that we are now instituting monitoring those children. So they'll all have their own passwords and we'll be able to monitor exactly what they're doing, even though we've got filtering. But alongside that, they're now monitoring the teachers. So every time I turn my laptop on, I'm told I'm being monitored. Two teachers have had um, chats with the um, SLT about the fact that, um, senior management rather, about the fact that they um, uh, have had trigger things come up on their laptops. One was weapons and the other one randomly was dating and companionship. Um, and what it led them to do was question everything they'd done, question their children about what their children might have done on their laptop when they were at home, question their husbands about what their husband might have done. And it just seems to me that monitoring takes it to the next level where you're actually 
um, you can't even be private in your own in your own in your own mind. So mm-hmm. I wonder what you think of that. Brilliant, thanks. Someone's got the microphone. Go ahead. Firstly, that was shocking and um, very sympathetic. Um, two things uh, different. Um, firstly, with regards to FOI, um, say you're to work in uh, a government body that purchases lots of services from private sector businesses, say the NHS, um, and you deal with lots of FOIs on a regular basis. Um, might be pertinent to point out that these things take up hundreds of hours um, over the course of the year. Um, and that costs a fortune in terms of the opportunity costs of what those people should be doing, which is trying to deliver proper, say, contract management of healthcare provision. Um, and a lot of them are literally just trying to jump the gun with getting information um, prior to future procurement exercises. Um, and it's a shocking waste of money, to be honest with you. It's very frustrating for the staff there. And I think there's room for the law to be amended on that. Um, and one thing completely unrelated, which might, might mothball, um, is there such a thing as too much privacy, say, when staff have been accused of something within a business or a government agency um, that might be potentially career ending um, and their accusers are able to be kept and keep themselves anonymous, even from HR. Yeah, I'm very interested in privacy relations between us, not just between us and the state. And between us, you know, as Greta Garbo said, I want to be left alone. Um, But we're not alone, we're in society. And although we might want uh, some privacy in our home, we do also exist with other people. So how do we square that? Well, for me, privacy between us is really about the relations between us and what we agree between us that should apply to all. And I think one of the biggest changes I've noted over the uh, last few years about how we approach privacy between us is the way that privacy by some groups argue that their privacy, for example, to uh, have their sexuality recognized um, involves uh, the uh, sort of uh, outing, really, of others, often heterosexual women, it seems at the moment, um, who are gender critical, uh, they're not allowed privacy. They have to be outed everywhere and chased down the street and, and, and threatened and, and so forth. So that, that is a really disturbing thing. In the name of privacy of some groups, the privacy of others are not allowed. And I think to cut through that, we have to raise the point of privacy is something for all, a principle between us that applies to all of us, whatever our background, sexualities and so forth. Um, Yes, I wonder what you think about the um, right of privacy of two groups of people. Um, People who report um, rape or sexual assault, should the police or the authorities have access to their mobile mobile phones? And the same with people who come across um, on small boats. Should the authorities be able to access their mobile phones? Thank you. In a world partly governed by uh, non-disclosure agreements Mm -hmm. and intellectual policy, uh, property rights, where large organizations and individuals can actually protect the privacy. Um, Should we make a distinction between uh, what is private and what is data ownership? And does data ownership and consent come into some part of the discourse and privacy into another? Whether I go to bed at night and I leave my window open, I leave a window open to my neighbors, perhaps, to peer into my private life. But when I put my data in a questionnaire, a pre-op questionnaire as, as to, about some very sensitive information about myself and my family, I am supposed to consent to this use of data. Now, who owns this data? So I think, to me, it is very important to start discussing the differences between privacy on one end Mm -hmm. and what it actually means and data ownership at the other end and what that actually means because the fact that we accept that the data that we use, for instance, on Instagram or or WhatsApp or whatever is actually owned by a private company and can be used in whichever way they like, Mm -hmm. does not mean that we have to accept that being used by any government body or in fact any body. 
Brilliant. Thank you. Brilliant. Listen, let's come. I'm going to come back to the panel for just like 30 second minute thoughts and then we'll go back out again. So don't I'm not haven't forgotten anyone. Let's start with you, Tim. Just like one thought. Right. Uh, so the question that we're getting down to is privacy sacrosanct? Plainly, it is not. There are moments where it is in the public interest, as we have discussed politically uh, or with the WhatsApp messages where one could do that. There are moments where it is in, in the interest of maintaining law and order where privacy has to be breached. Where I don't think privacy should be breached is when it's a question uh, of prurience. Obviously, I want to know what you're up to. Uh, or where it's convenience either for a government or for uh, a commercial enterprise. The reason why there are cameras on tills is because Tesco's, et cetera, et cetera, have sacked all their workers. Um, and because you're no longer operating a proper person-led till, you now have to spy on the people doing your shopping because if there's no human being helping you with your shopping, people will nick stuff. Um, I really want to look into this question of when does privacy emerge. It's a very interesting question. I, I, my thought, just my last thought, just goes to the Bible. The Bible uh, has moments uh, of privacy in it. Uh, for instance, Moses goes up the mountain to talk to God. Jesus Christ goes into the desert and he also goes away to pray by himself in the Garden of Gethsemane. But crucially, uh, none of those figures are alone at that moment. They are separated from human beings, but they're not separated from God. The point being that privacy is essentially a question of relations between human beings. But the private sphere, sphere is not necessarily an amoral one. On the contrary, uh, in, in Christian thinking, the private is where we can go to to be our most moral because we are with God and it's where we dwell upon our personal personal morality and our beliefs and our values. So the private sphere, don't think of it as some amoral playground. It's actually where we can be our best self. Brilliant. Tip. And related to that, it's quite interesting that um, although Pericles, it has to be said, does talk about the value of privacy in ancient Athens, I think it is a kind of eternal need and value, but it does change considerably its form and condition. But it's in the 17th century that you begin to get the use of the word private in relation to private prayer. Mm. And you were alone with God. Um, and I think you're often amongst many other people. And if you read the diaries of people talking about their private prayer, they talk about how they were praying privately very, very loudly so everybody could hear them. <laughs> so I don't know how silent it was. Um, <coughs> Pharisees it, and all that. <laughs> but you have, so, so why does it emerge when it does in its particular form in the sort of 17th and 18th century? It wasn't that people were on the streets demanding privacy. It was almost had an accidental quality. And I think you begin to see it forming out of debates over the need for freedom of conscience and toleration and a space then away from the religious conflicts that were kind of dominating Europe. And it's only in the like, sort of late 17th century that you have the sort of concept of toleration, which is the beginnings of the kind of modern private sphere. So do we still need toleration and freedom of conscience? Damn right we do. So yes, to Ivan's question. It then develops and it becomes a space of intimacy. It gets bigger and we have the beginning of, sort of the novel. So do we still need intimacy and novels? Yes, we certainly do. And as I said before, it's a sort of precondition of public life and we certainly need that and I think what you had with the personal and political really is the erosion of uh, the separation between public and private and almost the turning around of it so political issues became personal and personal issues became political so we need to re reverse that and then re-erect re the border between the two. David? Uh, let me just pick out just a few things the that hideous story of monitoring the, the lady who's a teacher I mean now you perhaps know why I was so uncomfortable with the online uh, the Online Safety uh, Act now, um, because it's the state trying to put itself virtually in loco parentis in place of teachers and, uh, and parents. Uh, and when I was a little child, uh, it was a parent's responsibility and they did it as best they could. Um, so if, if you try to do much, that's where you end up. Um, on, in the question of re uh, people reporting rape, illegal immigrants and so on, that all comes back to this issue that privacy dissolves at the point you've got actual criminal prosecutions in play. Uh, when you're doing that, then you have to have all, all data available. And the law's got lots and lots of quite complex rules about that. It also plays into the question of privacy versus public interest. And I just want to draw your attention to one very unpopular case. What changed modern privacy? law in Britain was more than anything really was a case to do with a man called Max Mosley. Mm -hmm. Max Mosley, 
yeah and uh he became he became the victim i think it's probably the right word um of some ta- of some tabloid newspapers his sex life and, and lots of whiplash and all the rest of it, all that sort of stuff and of course being um a relative i'm not sure if a descendant of the mosley of wartime fame made it all the more interesting and it was a definite demonstration of the difference between what is in the public interest and what is interesting to the public right mm-hmm. uh, and i think it was a european court case taken by liberty that actually won the case for mosley and it changed every newspaper's approach to privacy they had to then make out if this is a breach of somebody's privacy there has to be a real public interest to mention to it and that in my view was actually a beneficial change in the law I want to have a row with you about yeah. press freedom now, but we'll do it at another <laughs> session. Josie? I mean, I think part of the leaking is about a neutralisation of public critique. I mean, the scandal of lockdown was to do with the public acts, not to do with the fact they had a, an affair or who said what on WhatsApp. And I think that it's almost like the inability to critique the locking of a whole nation in their homes um, meant that people against lockdown could only get them by finding out that Ferguson had an affair or, or that Hancock had an affair. So I think, and I, I think that's the same with the HR department. You know, I've answered so many uh, council surveys where you go through and you can't actually say you disagree with the measure. Um, but then you get this long, long section at the end, your sexuality, your ethnicity, blah, blah, blah. so they want to know everything about you, but they don't want to know your political opinion, which is that I completely disagree with your you know, att- attempt to ban all these issues in public spaces. So I think there is a kind of neutralization of public critique, which means that you focus on the personal. Um, on the FOI Act, um, I completely disagree with Tiffany. I, mean, I think it's so important because of the increasingly opaque nature of a lot of the operations of policy. Um, so I've collected FOI data on things the government should be collecting FOI data, should be cl- publishing data on, such as the number of councils that have banned, um, created public spaces protection orders, number of community protection notices issued in public spaces. You know, 15 years ago, those things were publicly available. They were scrutinized, they were assessed. That is no longer the case. A lot of policy becoming increasingly opaque and it's almost the citizen uh, journalists or campaigners who can create the policy. I, I disagree. It's not, it's not just leaking. It's not just the information itself. I mean, there is that element with Snowden, that kind of thing. But actually, if you use the FOI Act properly, then you're critiquing it. So you get the information. You can say what that means. And so in a way, it, it, it gives the authority to the person critiqu- critiquing the actions of the state to say, this is what it means. Mm-hmm. Now, if they produce that information themselves, they can say what it means, but they can't be bothered. So, you know, I think that, that it's so important to actually be able to um, get some of the opacity um, revealed. OK, great. I'm going to have to go back out. So I'm going to take a few more. We've only got seven minutes left. I think this comes down to just trying to be quick, uh, an issue of two things, choice and centralization. I think a lot of people have made the choice. They're not that interested in privacy anymore. They've got ring doorbells, Amazon Alexa and Google Nests and that sort of thing. For convenience, they've made that trade off. I mean, I don't really agree with convenience. A prison cell with a toilet is convenient, but I don't want it. Um, the worry I have is when that stops being a matter of choice and you have to give up information in order to participate in society. And actually, that comes to the point of centralization. David, your campaign about ID cards, I thoroughly admired it, but I think we're, we're past that now and it's been lost. And every, we've got an ID system that's all based on your email address is your unique identifier. Every government online service you use, every yeah, online ID account, card. every job application, um, even a shop that says, would you like an email receipt? All of those are linking you up by your unique identifier, which is your email address, which is even better targeted than your national insurance number. Lovely. Uh, my concern is really mobile phones. I have two laptops and I get so fed up with number of emails, I, I deliberately leave home without a mobile phone. I sometimes have a, uh, without a smartphone, I have a small mobile phone. The trouble is increasingly, it seems to be, oh, you do have a, 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 you do have a smartphone, therefore we're going to close all the booking offices and everything because I think it's going to be on the smartphone or whatever. What is the way around that? Another interesting thing, people talk about um, at the NHS. Now, I'm chair of the local patient participation group. And the biggest thing we find is older people who can't actually cope. They don't know how to handle IT. If these days it's assumed everyone is good at IT uh, and everyone, everyone is on LinkedIn or whatever, therefore I'm saying, I'll log in with YouTube, LinkedIn. Well, I do. I am on a number of um, things, but a number of websites, but not ones with um, with algorithms. I can't stand them. The trouble is, what do I do? It seems that uh, you know people like me aren't taking accounts off now. No, you're, I'm entirely with you in spirit and everything. There was a there's a shop in Hackney, a coffee shop that wanted me to sign up to an app 
to get a QR code for a cup to get a cup of coffee. <laughs> so I'm with you <laughs> definitely right here in the front. Actually, I'm from a country where privacy, citizen privacy is a matter of joke to the government. Uh, but uh, in terms of public, uh, is the government actually doing something to make them actually aware what is the term privacy in terms of this digital space we are having right now? Because in 2015, I remember uh, most of my friends have shifted to Snapchat from WhatsApp because it advertised that it is a private way of communication but they are actually accepting all the permissions for accessing the contents in their phone. So are we actually being made aware what actually is privacy in terms of these things? Brilliant. Thanks. Okay, down here, sir. Firstly, thanks, Tim, for that tip about the, um, the bag over the self-service. <laughs> <laughs> you are definitely not alone. I just wanted to ask about the, the absurdity or perversity somebody might, some of you might have experienced where a company uses your own personal data to frustrate you from in, uh, undertaking uh, a service which you take to be in your own interest. And uh, a clear example of this is, don't you find it increasingly difficult actually to make a bank transaction because you don't know all the personal data which the, the bank holds on you in order to make that transaction. Mm. And I had a really horrific experience, um, which reminds me, I need to complain about this, um, <laughs> when I was making a, a transaction for a funeral expense for the following day uh, for a family member, sadly, and the bank, needed to be satisfied that I really needed to do it. Are you sure you want to make this transaction? I've done it all online and I couldn't actually do the, the final step. And it turned out that the bank that I was the recipient was on a kind of a blacklist. And it was just, it was you know, unforgivably difficult for me to be able to make that transaction. And it wasn't sufficient. There's an over technologization now of our society in which it just wasn't sufficient for the person on the other end to, um, to believe me. He said, oh, well, I do trust you, but it was really a obscene situation that we find ourselves now, the over-securitization in the name of our interest. We've heard a lot about sort of erosions of privacy. Um, there's recently been the online safety bill. But it seems to me that this all seems part of a broader long-term shift from thinking of people as citizens with rights to be respected to consumers with wants and needs to be managed. Um, if it is like that, is this permanent or is it reversible? You wanted the alternative view on the privacy. Well, as far as I'm concerned, if you know the contents of Act, there is nothing about my work life worth knowing you don't know. And that applies to every single one of us. So privacy, whilst it was a nice idea, and I believed I grew up with it, it's a thing of the past. It doesn't exist anymore. Your phone spies on you, your house does, your TV, your ring, your nest, whatever it is. Okay. Everything is known. Yeah. We are fully survived. Okay. And we can also see now, after the last three years, nothing personal to Mr Davies, but we're run by criminals and drug pushers. Yes, <laughs> drug yep. pushers. Okay. Look at in the eye. And so because of that, I say embrace the surveillance. Okay. Because we're run by bullying, bribery and blackmail. Well, it's very difficult to bully, bribe or blackmail someone who's permanently surveilled. Okay. You think you're a fit and proper person? Make rules for me to live my life by. Let's have a look at yours. Every grubby detail. Okay. Doesn't mean I won't vote for you. Okay. Very well put for that side of the argument. You know, the, the, the word that keeps ringing in my head now, and we're going to the, the speakers are just going to have 30 seconds, so the word keeps ringing in my head also is shame. You know, the idea of public shame. If you look at, for example, on the tube, you get this message, see it, say it, sorted. Sorted, not sort it. Don't you, mm -hmm. don't you do anything, just film it and send it to, I don't know, Sadiq Khan or someone. All these signs that say, if you see sexual harassment, please record it and tell us, rather than like get the guy by the throat and stop him from doing whatever he's doing. Um, so what does this constant surveillance, actually, if, if you're, you're advocating for a sort of let's see it all, does that entail... Okay, but does that mean then that we have a sense of public shame and our behaviours change for the better or for the worse? Or is it just that we just end up with this flabby, let it all hang out, kind of nobody do anything sort of society? We're going to go back to the speakers now um, and do it in the order that we spoke in. 30 seconds, guys, just one thought. 
Um, so, David, let's begin with you. Right. Um, uh, have we lost the battle? The person who wrote, talked about uh, ID cards and, and so on. And are we facing a long term trend from rights to duties? Well, yes, we are facing the, the, those trends. And yes, it is a it is a battle which we're not winning. But it's like the, it's like the demise of Rome. It can either take five minutes or it can take 400 years. And if I have my way, it'll take 400 years. Brilliant. Thanks very much. OK. Listen, before I forget, can I also just say thank you to the volunteers in this room? Because we end up pointing at you and squinting at you. So thank you very much for doing that. Yes, thank you. They deserve it. Uh, Josie. No, I think there's very much in terms of surveillance that becomes the new citizenship. You know, if you're not in a database, you don't exist. And I think the point David makes about they reach for that whenever they have a problem. It's almost like that reconstituting the population and the relationship with population through face scans, uh, retinal scans, etc. The only final point I'd make is um, I think that the, the, the conditions for privacy have eroded. And we have, a, in some senses, returned to the, to the medieval thing about uh, revelation as the basis for authority. So the king... Um, in his bedchamber, even his toilet chamber, that was the great place of the greatest honor and political importance in medieval society, was the toilet chamber of the king. I think that in a way we have that now, whereby revelation is the basis for authority. But unlike medieval society, I think it's a very unstable situation and it, it's incredibly dysfunctional. So I don't think it's a, a stable transition to a new order. I think it's very much um, the corroding of the basis for the old system of privacy, um, which was kind of bourgeois productive culture. Um, but there's no new order. And so the system is fraught with problems and therefore fraught with potential for opposing it. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Josie. Tim. Thank you. I think shame is ideally a private matter in the sense that it, it comes, it flows from the individual conscience. So I don't steal something, not because I'm worried there's a camera that will catch me doing it and, and I will be embarrassed. I don't steal because it's wrong to steal. I self-police. On the question of technology, uh, I recently fell down a rabbit hole because when I was in Greece, both my phone and my wallet were stolen. And to try to get a new phone without a wallet or to try to get all your cards replaced without a phone, uh, you, you essentially disappear off the grid. And so I spent about two weeks trying to get both those things, which just this computer would not work. They couldn't understand because I couldn't share my information. No one would give me anything. But you know what? It was two of the happiest weeks of my life. Tim. Because no one could ring me. I used cash. Uh, I, I saved say, Tim, money. is this stuff called cash? It's new, you know. And I, and I, I yeah, but how do you get the cash out of the bank? Uh, but nonetheless, I, I loved it. So actually, sometimes disappearing, forcing yourself to go off the grid by happenstance can be a good thing. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Tim. <laughs> Tiff, finish uh, up. Well, we all have secrets in this room. Every single one of you has more than one secret, and you're able to keep it secret when you need to. Um, so I think there's, um, there's certainly a degree where that is possible and necessary. The threat, however, is not technological. So the solution isn't to go off grid. It's got to be a lot, a lot, a lot bigger than that, really. It's a, it's a call for what John Stuart Mill called experiments in living. The ability to have a private space where you do really what you want to do, even if it's foolish, dumb and stupid. And that is, in a way, what's undermined here. I just want to finish by reading a very short thing by Will Davis in The Guardian about what's wrong with WhatsApp and why WhatsApp should be uh, banned. Um, he summed up the threat posed by private conversations on the app by saying, it is understandable that in order to relax, users need to know they're not being overheard. Though there is a less playful side to this. If groups are perceived as a place to say what you really think, away from the constraints of public judgment or political correctness, then it follows that they are also where people turn to share prejudices or more hateful expressions that are unacceptable or even illegal elsewhere. What makes WhatsApp potentially more dangerous than public social media are the higher levels of trust and honesty that are often available in public groups. So trust and honesty are why we need privacy and why it's a bigger discussion than technology. Thank you very much. Thanks to all our speakers.